people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, and now it's time for our weekend recap. We're gonna kick it off with the Gabriela Fundora versus Christina Cruz flyweight title fight, what was a battle of the unbeatens going in. And the fight worked out as I predicted, as I expected, that Christina Cruz, who comes from a very solid amateur background, she has the look of a pure boxer, yeah. an outside fighter, a mover, yeah. and a pot shotter. She's used to being the taller, longer fighter in the ring. She's very tall for flyweight, but she's not taller than Gabriela Fundora. So where normally she can box from the outside comfortably, she would be rather uncomfortable in this fight. Tack on that Gabriela's got more firepower than Christina Cruz has. Almost immediately at the start of the fight you see Gabriella getting the jab out there Gabriella who fights out of the southpaw stance whereas Christina Cruz she's an orthodox fighter Gabriella leads with the right whereas Christina leads with the left at the start of the match you see they're fencing with the jabs they're fencing and as they're doing that Christina is being backed into the ropes she couldn't hold the center it was very obvious very early in the match that Gabriella would stay in character and stay the aggressor whereas Christina would be the defender curious scorecard after four rounds from veteran boxing scribe Chris Mannix he had Christina Cruz up four rounds to zip after four I didn't rounds in a match so often being open to interpretation by the spectator and what is this spectator sport I didn't figure that Christina Cruz could be up on the cards after four rounds giving up so much ground so much real estate being backed into those ropes and being outlanded that not all the jabs that Gabriela Fundora landed were hard jabs and powerful jabs but she was regularly getting them off and there was visible redness around the face of Christina Cruz after four rounds the handiwork of Gabriela Fundora's jab she kept the jab working she kept the straight working and after the straight she'd follow up with a short right hook but if Christina's still within range after Gabriela gets off the straight there's a right hook that's gonna follow it she landed that right hook several times she was grinding Christina Cruz down who was doing all right at the start hanging tough and hanging in there, but was succumbing to the pressure. That's not to say that Christina Cruz didn't get off decent looking punches of her own. She did at the start, but little by little, her output dissipated to the point where she's just moving from one end of the ring to the other. This is boxing, not freeze tag. The idea that because you're shuffling from one end of the ring to the other, you're winning the fight as the away fighter against the house fighter, as the challenger against the champion. I mean, I don't know what people were thinking. I don't know what Chris Mannix was thinking, but I had Gabriela Fundora well ahead. The most that I could give Christina Cruz in this fight was two rounds. It's a common sense argument. If Michaela Mayer's come forward aggression inside fighting and the fact that she outlanded Natasha Jonas in seven out of 10 rounds, if that wasn't enough to win her a decision in Liverpool, why would Christina's outside fighting have her up on the cards in Arizona? Like I said, I don't know what you guys were thinking, but during the live broadcast and during my live stream, I told you, Gabriella's well ahead. And that's what the judges' scorecards show. All three judges had Gabriella well ahead of Christina. The so obvious ring general of the fight, moving Christina Cruz from one end of the ring to the other, the more prolific puncher, the busier fighter throughout the round, throughout the rounds, the harder puncher of the two, landing the more eye-catching shots. And what do you guys think? That any boxer that sidles along the ropes from one turnbuckle to the next is winning the round? Is that how you think you win the round? Is it? As the away fighter. The problem with Christina Cruz's strategy is she's accustomed to being the taller, longer fighter who can box comfortably from the outside, but you can't do that against a taller fighter than yourself because you're gonna be a sitting duck out there. You're gonna be a sitting duck for the jab, 
the straight, and that's what we saw in the fight, that round after round, Gabriella doesn't need to be close to Christina to touch it because she's got the kind of height, the kind of length, the way she can touch it from the outside coming in. So if you're staying on the outside, you're setting yourself up to fail. You're a sitting duck out there. The pace of the match caught up to Christina Cruz, and I expected it to because Christina Cruz is quite literally 20 years older than Gabriella Fundora and her methodology, that pure boxer based style. Pure boxers don't do well under pressure. How many times and how many videos have you heard me say that? Christina's a good outside fighter, pot shotter, but that has its limitations. She ain't got no inside game. She's not a combination puncher or a strong puncher. She can't match Gabriella's power. So round after round, she was worn down to the point to where she turns all the way around after getting hit with clean shots. She literally turns all the way around, bends over, tucks up, at which point referee Chris Flores had seen enough. He waved it off. You don't do that. You don't give your back to your opponent. You don't turn all the way around and bend over. I mean, what kind of body language is that? What message are you sending to the ref? Bear in mind, while she's doing that, Gabriella's still getting off clean shots. She's working her midsection. She didn't stop punching. It's the referee's job to protect the fighter when a fighter can't protect themselves. And what message are you sending him when you turn your back on your opponent, you bend over, you tuck up, you're getting hit? It's obvious why he stopped it, though some people were complaining after the match, saying that it was a bad stoppage. Well, what the hell do you think was gonna happen? If Chris Flores would have let the contest go on. What, you think Christina was about to turn it around? She's not a concussive puncher. She's not a big puncher to where one punch can turn the tide for her. She was so obviously getting grinded down her output had dissipated. Behind on the cards by several rounds and getting hit clean. And you're complaining that Chris let the contest go on? What do you think was about to happen? I don't think it was a bad stoppage. Based on what led to that stoppage, you could see that if he doesn't wave it off now, he's going to end up waving it off later. Boxing fans have a way of being malcontents, at least some of them, always looking for something to complain about when you see what direction the fight was going the stoppage was good in my humble opinion gabriella was able to meet and exceed my expectations i thought she went on points she took it a step further took it out of the judge's hands what more do you want congratulations to her we then come to the main event of that same card the super middleweight contest between Jaime Munguia, the former champion and unbeaten fighter, and John Ryder, the seasoned veteran, would serve as a common opponent between Jaime Munguia and Canelo Alvarez. I think Jaime's performance in this fight set that up beautifully because he looked more put together. He looked sharper than he's ever looked in this fight, and I think that having veteran trainer Freddie Roach in his corner had a lot to do with that, which I talked about in the lead-in to the fight. I said that, you know, Eric Morales, who was training Jaime up until this point, he was a very good fighter, but he wasn't much of a trainer, that he didn't have the level of experience of a Freddie Roach or somebody else, and, and before Jaime was being trained by Eric, he was being trained by his father. So in many ways, going into this fight, it would be the first time that he had a real trainer, a real veteran. A vet. A guy who knows what he's doing and has trained high-level fighters, several high-level fighters. I think it made a difference. I think... For those of you that didn't see that video, I'll leave the link to it in the comment section. I said with a guy like Jaime, you don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. You don't go in there trying to turn him into a boxer or just something that he isn't. You just sharpen what he's already good at. At his very best, he's a pressure fighter. He's an offensively minded fighter and Freddie Roach is an offensively minded trainer. So it could be a fruitful pairing. It could be a good pairing. And I think we saw the evidence of that, that. last night in Arizona as he battered John Ryder worse, I'd say, than Canelo Alvarez did several months ago when he fought him. And I said in my previous video, context is key. John Ryder is coming off a 12-round beating where he was knocked down two times in the Canelo Alvarez fight. He's tenderized, though. He's definitely tenderized. He's going from a 12-round beating with one of the hardest punchers at the weight to go into another beating with another hard puncher. So there's a chance that Jaime might stop him, but it's still very good optics. Irrespective of the context, it's good optics that Jaime looked the way that he looked with John and that he dropped John three more times than Canelo did en route to stopping him, which Canelo didn't. It's a good look and it's good optics. You don't have to over 
think it. It's a good advertisement for a Mungia versus Canelo fight down the line, the way that Jaime performed. And what is it that he did? What was so different about him? Well, the jab was working. Let's talk about the jab. I would say that the running theme for yesterday's Golden Boy Promotions show was educated pressure, whether you're talking about Gabriela Fundora's educated pressure or Jaime Munguia's educated pressure. Utilizing the jab more often and more effectively than he ever has in previous outings. And once again, I think that's something that him and Freddie Roach worked on. Yeah. Jaime can generate great power when he straightens on his arm, when he's getting those straight punches out from the outside coming in as he steps into his jab. And he was using that jab, doubling up on it, tripling up on it. He's a tall, long fighter, even for this weight. So he can generate great power if he has room to throw. And he gave himself that room by setting up the right with his left the way that you're supposed to. He's not just going in there throwing those college frat boy punches, those wide punches, those looping hooks. No, use the jab. Everything off the jab. You know, the second knockdown that he scored in the first half of the fight, that was off the jab. That was off a counter jab. He caught John Ryder trying to come in, caught him flush, knocked him down for the second time, and dropped him five times overall. It was the little things, slight differences in Jaime's approach that they seemed to have worked on because he still had the guy under pressure and he's still throwing punches in bunches, but his his methodology was a bit more measured, a bit more refined, using the jab to set up the straight and the straight right hand. It was working. He landed a lot, and I mean a lot of right hands, because he was working the jab to set it up, set it up properly. John Ryder, to his credit, he did try to counter that jab with a right hook around the side, a counter right hook, but you know, Jaime's so much taller and so much longer that once he gets going throwing those straight punches from the outside coming in, it's hard to hold him back. It was hard for John, a hard night's work. So we saw more of a jab to set up the straight. We saw a lot of straight punches from Jaime Munguia, which were his best punches in this fight where normally you might see him trading hooks with the other guy, yeah. mid-range to inside, and this this fight, it was his straight punches that were his best punches. His long range punches, his offense was a little better, yeah. his defense was a little better. He didn't get hit as much in his fight yeah. as he normally does. He didn't get hit as much in his fight as he did in the Derry Vianchenko fight, or the Rosado fight, the Gabriel Rosado fight. Or the Hogan fight. So slight differences in Jaime's approach while still being offensive, he was more responsible. Which rounds out the package and what you saw overall, that he was offensively a little better, defensively a little better, and better overall. And that's after just one training camp with Freddie Roach. Just one training camp. What's he gonna look like two fights from now, three fights from now? You know, Jaime, he's already got a lot of pro experience, but because he's young, he can still learn. I had a lot of fun with the fight, had a lot of fun with the show, and I was thoroughly impressed with Jaime Munguia's improvements because he is still improving. And because this fight went down in Arizona, which is David Benavidez's neck of the woods, WBC interim champion David Benavidez, who's vying for a Canelo Alvarez fight, the same as Jaime, this has already given rise to discussions as to who really deserves that Canelo Alvarez fight. And what fight is the bigger fight? The Munguia fight or the Benavidez fight? I think it's a bit of a redundancy because who says that Canelo can't fight them both? Obviously not at the same time in sequence, but I don't look at it as an either or kind of deal. As well as discussions about who the better bruiser is. Who's the better pressure guy? David or Jaime. David Benavidez took to his Instagram stories to react to Jaime Munguia's knockout when leaving a caption that reads, this is an easy knockout. That's why they ducked me. An easy knockout. Easy like Caleb was supposed to be easy for David Benavidez. Do you remember that in the lead into their fight, he promised he would knock him out. He promised he would stop him, but he didn't. Oh. Whereas Jaime did a comparatively better job on John than David did on Caleb. And remember that by then, Caleb had already been stopped by Canelo Alvarez. It was a year from the Canelo Alvarez fight, the night that David fought him. But he didn't stop him. He definitely beat him. Oh, he beat him. But he didn't stop him. He didn't knock him out. He didn't even knock him down. The same way that Jaime Munguia knocked down John Ryder. Not once, not twice, not thrice, not four times, but five times. Five. Five en route to stopping him. So if I had to guess, what was a better advertisement? What was a better lead-in 
to a Canelo Alvarez fight, a potential one, I'd say Jaime's performance against John was better than David's performance against Caleb. But David did see action after that. He saw action. He fought Demetrius Andre. He stopped him. But the reason I didn't bring him up is because he's not a common opponent between Canelo Alvarez and those fighters. Caleb Plant is a common opponent between Canelo and David, and John Ryder is a common opponent between Canelo and Jaime, whereas Demetrius, he's not a common opponent with him. He's not really a common opponent for anybody because he never fought anybody. He was a 36-year-old guy with no signature wins. That's what he was. He's not worth talking about. He's not worth remembering. I'm not gonna get into an argument about it, no matter how much the Hamanites hype him up or how much the Hamanites hype up David for beating him because I said that he would beat him. What's your point? My point is that Jaime Munguia's performance yesterday has made him a legitimate contender and a legitimate candidate to win the Canelo Alvarez sweepstakes at some point, presumably in May or afterwards. He made a splash with his performance against John Ryder. A bigger splash to me and some others than David did. Opposite the ring, Caleb Plant. Point is, you don't end up fighting a common opponent between yourself and Canelo Alvarez for no reason. That's not by accident. That's by design. David and Caleb have been on the same side of the street for years. He could have fought that guy a long, long time ago, back when they were both unbeaten champions, but they chose not to. No, they chose to wait good up until Canelo already knocked him out. A year after he knocked him out. And that's by design. Let's call it what it is. You were doing the whole who did it better routine, the who did it better deal, and as it turns out, Melo did it better than you did, and Jaime, Jaime beat John better than he did. That's the look. Why do you think I kept saying in my previous video it would be good optics if Jaime went in there and stopped this guy where Canelo didn't? It's not something that you have to overthink. It's an advertisement for Jaime to one day share the ring with Canelo. It's a sales pitch. No more, no less. Not something that you have to overthink or read too much into. That's all it is. I think that Jaime has greater potential to become the face of Mexican boxing after Canelo Alvarez is done than David Benavides because Jaime is a Mexican national, whereas David, David's an American, born on American soil. He's just a fighter of Mexican descent. He's not a Mexican national. He won't appeal to them in all the ways that Jaime can. A few unqualified individuals trying to have this discussion, trying to have this conversation, a few of them aside, Jaime is a Mexican national. Yeah. He draws well whether you like him or not. Yeah. And this is not about ability per se, because both Jaime and David are of limited ability. Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about. Canelo versus Munguia is a big fight, or it could be. Tijuana versus Jalisco, a fight between two Mexican nationals. You can sell that. While a lot of unqualified individuals to have this conversation keep trying to oversell David Benavidez as this big draw amongst the Mexican fans, this big name, this big guy, you know, his pay-per-views didn't sell nothing. So what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Him and Canelo could be a big fight, could be a big fight, but the same can be said for him and Jaime. Especially after yesterday's fight. He called him out after the fight. He said he'd like to fight him. A lot of people would like to see it. And that's the bottom line. 